So two years ago, we bought this project boat, with the idea to restore her, to convert her into a sailing ship and to teach sailing on a true tall ship. But let's start at the beginning. Before we had the crazy idea of restoring an historic steel boat and get into boat building, we were sailing teachers, sail trainers and professional sail racers. And Barbara even worked as a ship mechanic apprentice aboard this huge merchant vessel. But after a decade of sail racing, we felt it was time for a new chapter in life. So we bought Flying Coney. Hello, it's so good to see you again. I am Barbara and together with Daniel I restored a historic sailing ship, Flying Coney. When we decided to buy a boat, we had basically two options. One was to buy a sailing yacht, go sailing, share everything here on YouTube and have a nice life underneath palm trees. And the other one was to buy a sailing ship, refit it and offer sail trainings. So the question was sunny beaches, palm trees and simply enjoying life or hard work, lots of uncertainties and bad weather even in the so-called summer. But we really wanted to teach traditional sailing skills and go on sailing adventures with a lot of people. So instead of buying a sailing yacht for just the two of us, we decided to head to the Netherlands and buy a project boat. So with that decision settled, we started our search for a sailing ship. We bought Flying Coney even though we knew that she was a big project and not even a sailing ship yet. But buying a trawler and converting it into a sailing ship is not as unusual as it might seem. Actually most tall ships or historic sailing ships started their lives as motorized fishing vessels. And when they dropped out of commercial fishing, they were converted into sailing ships. Of course the sailing performance depends a lot on the hull shape. And we are really lucky, because Flying Coney has the perfect hull shape to convert her into a sailing ship. So the hull shape and her pleasing lines were the reasons why we bought Flying Coney. After we bought the boat, it was time to move aboard, because the plan always was to live aboard Flying Coney during the restoration. As soon as we settled in, we started with the first smaller projects. But shortly thereafter, we realized we forgot something. And that thing was the rapidly arriving winter. Working on the boat is one thing, but doing it outside in the wind, the rain, and the frost is a thing we completely underestimated. Of course there are things you basically can't do in bad weather, like painting, but there are a lot of other things you can work on. However, the weather significantly slows you down. You can't bring any big stuff aboard when it's really windy. You don't want to leave anything outside when it's raining. You can't leave the doors open for better ventilation in heavy rain or storm. And if you think that's just the winter, you still have half a year of good weather, well, no. Because actually the coldest winter I've ever witnessed was the summer in the Netherlands. We wouldn't mention the weather because there's not much you can do about it. But setting up the right work environment proved to be the biggest challenge throughout this whole refit project. The boat simply is too big to put it in a shed, but we definitely understand the benefits of having one. So we always have to plan around the weather and often that involves taking compromises or quick fixes. But it's not only the weather that proved to be challenging. At the beginning Flying Coney was moored on the landing stage without running water and electricity or pretty much anything. So that meant the true off-grid experience for us. Each time we needed electricity, we had to run a generator. And then the generator need maintenance. And before you know it, setting up the proper work environment takes up more time than the work itself. Buying a project boat is always a big adventure. You can't take the whole ship apart before you buy it. So as soon as you start to rip things out, you will find something. And then you have to repair it. But that's what makes working on an old boat interesting. You feel like an archaeologist digging through the layers of past restorations. 
you see what methods had worked and which failed and how everything was constructed and where things were added or changed later on. And since there is almost nothing that can't be repaired on a steel ship, everything we find is just another point on our to-do list and one more thing that we learn while we rebuild Flying Coney. As soon as we reached down to the hull and found an immense level of rust, we immediately made an appointment at the shipyard to take Flying County out of the water and have her hull inspected. As you all know, refitting a boat can be very tough and frustrating at times. And on top of it, we had to deal with some personal challenges as well. Unfortunately, both our bunnies passed away. Starting a YouTube channel is a challenge on its own, we had to face some health issues and on top of it, to make matters worse, the weather didn't help either. When it's always cold, rainy, dark and stormy, it doesn't help to lift the mood. So we thought it would be a good idea to talk to someone who is professionally trained and who could help us with these setbacks. But since we travel a lot, finding a therapist proved to be difficult. Luckily, there is a platform called BetterHelp, which is also the sponsor of today's video. And if you go to betterhelp.com slash flyingcony or click on the link below, it might help you as well and you even get 10% off your first month. So BetterHelp is an online service that connects you with a professional therapist, making it really easy to get help wherever you may be. In my weekly sessions, I learned how important it is to set time aside to recover and how to develop, and for me, even more important, how to keep daily routines like meditating that help me to handle the stress and setbacks that comes not only with a huge restoration project, but also with daily life. BetterHelp makes it easy to find a therapist. You just fill out a questionnaire and most of the time you get matched to a therapist within 48 hours. For Daniel, this matchmaking worked out perfectly. However, I chose to change therapist after the first session, because we are all human and finding the right therapist is important. Thankfully, BetterHelp makes this as simple as clicking a button in your settings. Therapy can help you to live a healthier and happier life. So if you want to give it a try too, then click the link in the description or go to betterhelp.com slash flyingcony. With the set decision to take Flying Coney out of the water, the next step was to bring her to the shipyard on Urk. A trip we looked very much forward to. Because after all, we bought Flying Coney to sail her and not only to work on her. We often get asked how we learned to sail such a big ship. Well, we spent the last 15 years doing not much else than sailing. And throughout this time, we developed kind of a sixth sense on how boats move and an understanding of how to maneuver boats in all kinds of conditions. And even so, Flying Coney is way bigger than what we used to sail, she still is a boat and moves like a boat. Having said that, it still is a huge challenge to handle such a ship, especially in small harbors without a boat thruster. But when you want to learn to sail such a ship, then there is no other way than doing it. Since this was the first time we took Flying Coney out of the water, it was a very important step for the whole boat restoration. Because it was the first time we could inspect her entire hull and get an idea what needs to be done to bring Flying Coney back to her former glory. Every shipyard time starts with pressure washing the hull. 
to get rid of all the dirt and marine growth. And all of you who already follow our journey for a while, of course know that after this pressure wash, we found a massive electrolysis damage. So small pittings all over the hull. And long story short, all of them needed to be welded. But before the lads from the shipyard could start welding, we had to remove all the interior and insulation that was right on the hull to avoid setting flying coney on fire. We decided to hire out the welding job. First of all, for liability reasons, and second, because a professional welder is way quicker than we are, and there was so much else to do. So we decided to let the lads from the shipyards do the welding and do everything else on our own. And that's when we started to rip everything apart while we still lived aboard Flying Coney. Because of all the welding, all the heat we introduced into the hull and intensive inspection, unfortunately we also found some holes. And we know that there are several ways of fixing them. And we also know that it is a quite controversial topic. However, because Flying Coney is registered as a pleasure craft, we are allowed to use doublings as a repair method. And because of the riveted hull, the old steel and the experience the shipyard has with this repair method, we decided to go with doublings. But everyone else owning an 82 feet riveted steel vessel can make his own decision. And of course, all the repairs have to be in compliance with your class surveyor. So why do we think that overplating is a valid repair method? Well, while de-rusting the waterline, we found a thin spot, aka hole, in a protective overplating that was there to protect the hull from the cables while fishing. This overplating was in place for 70 years. Instead of fixing the fix, and also because we are not towing nets anymore, we decided to remove the overplating and have a look at the hull underneath. Turned out that the hull is actually in good condition and after a bit of prep work it was ready to paint. And the hole in the protective overplating was only there because there was a through hull underneath it. So far all the work came mainly unexpected, but we also had some tasks planned for the shipyard's time. And the biggest one was to get rid of all the rust at the waterline and recoat the entire height. Which proved to be a challenge, because it was a huge task taking several weeks. And with the quickly approaching winter, the weather window for getting the paint on was rapidly closing. We really like Flying Coney's new color. The dark blue is a really good fit. But we decided to paint only the hull and let the bulwark as it is for the moment because we ran out of time. However, there still were some tasks on our to-do list before we could finally launch her. Besides the two major tasks, fixing the hull and recoating it, we also had numerous smaller tasks to do. We had the hull thickness measured and checked, the stuffing box repacked, and removed all but one through hole and renewed the only remaining one. 
And then there still was this nasty surprise in the forecastle. One of the former owners left us a full, leaking wastewater tank. So we cut it open, shoveled out the crap and cut it into pieces. To have the tank out was probably the most satisfying thing of the whole shipyard time. And we also got rid of a ton of rust with an air chisel, because first of all, less rust is always better, and second, we wanted to test the hull for weak spots and make absolutely sure that there are no holes. Since there was so much welding to do on the hull, and Flying Coney is a riveted hull, it is not unusual that there are leaks when launching. So we've planned to do a float test. The idea was to have a sit on the cart for at least half a day and see if there is any water coming in. On a cold day in November, it was finally time to get the boat back into the water. To let her sit for some hours and check for leaks. Luckily we only found some minor problems, but it was necessary to take her out again. And after launching her a second time, we found a reason to exchange the starting batteries. We had to tow Flying Coney to the landing stage by hand. And as you see, you don't need a big tugboat to move a 100 ton ship. Just some lines, manpower and a bit of time. But since rowing back to Lelystad was no option, we installed brand new starter batteries. Started the engine. Yay! And after over three months on the hard, it was finally time to sail back to Lelystad. Even though we ripped out a lot of interior and insulation during the shipyard's time, we left everything in place that wasn't directly on the hull. So now was the time to remove the remaining interior and insulation. And just to make one thing clear, we always knew that we have to remove and rebuild all the interior. But we might have underestimated a bit how long it takes to rip everything out. And putting it back in will be even more time consuming, but much more rewarding. One task we really underestimated was YouTube. We are really grateful for everyone who watches our videos and it is a privilege to share this whole adventure with so many of you. However, making and editing these videos takes up a fair bit of time and we always hoped spending this extra time would help us on the long run to pay at least partly for the refit costs. But since we started this channel two years ago, growing a channel on YouTube got more and more difficult. So after two years of making videos, we still can't live from the income we generate let alone paying the bills for this enormous refit project. Of course, we always had backup plans what to do if YouTube wouldn't work out for us. But I'm afraid all of them would involve not making YouTube videos anymore. Because we simply wouldn't have enough time. So we really hope we can improve this channel within the next months and finally make a living out of it. Because sharing this adventure with all of you is really what we want to do. So a big thanks to all of you for watching our videos. It is still unbelievable how many are interested in Flying Coney's refit and reading your encouraging comments really keeps us going even when times are tough. And a special thanks goes to all our Patreons, supporters and volunteers. The big task for the two weeks of summer was to get the wheelhouse back into shape or at least to prevent further damage. Luckily, we did get some help from Harold, a trained shipwright who was working on one of the other boats on Urk. The most important step was to examine the condition of the roof. We knew that there was some rot in the corner and the paint was flaking off on some spots. However, 
When we took off the solar panels, we realized that the condition is much worse than we expected. With a scraper, we investigated further. Of course, we know that the best solution would be to renew the whole roof and glass it over. But it was already late in the summer and there simply wasn't enough time for a job of this scale. But we needed a quick fix to avoid water intruding into the wheelhouse and prevent further damage. So the solution we came up with was to sheet it all over with leftover marine ply from the interior. One of the more challenging repairs was the rotten corner, but Harold did a great job that will last many years to come. In the meantime, we took care of the flaking varnish on the teak doors and window frames. Also, we haven't managed to put new varnish on, it's better for the wood to have no varnish at all than to have old varnish where water gets trapped underneath. Another woodworking project was to renew the completely rotten nephlite bases. Harold built them, we coated them, mounted them and installed the nephlites. The only thing that is missing is to add a layer of matte black on the outside to comply with the coal racks. The last thing on our wheelhouse to-do list was to permanently and properly install the solar panels. One little side project was to build a proper chart table. After all the destruction work, it feels really good to finally build up, to make something that will last. And we enjoyed the woodworking way more than all the dusty, dirty destruction work. So we look very much forward to the interior building. However, as soon as the last layer of paint was on the wheelhouse roof, it started raining. And it hasn't stopped ever since, which made working on Flying Coney quite difficult. The plan for the rest of the year was to maintain the engine and then head over the North Sea to Germany. So we set everything up to change the oil and the filters. But then we discovered a broken hose. And even though it wouldn't have been a problem to change that one, changing all of them would have been quite a task. And since they are all pretty old, we didn't want to trust them for a journey on the North Sea. So we changed plans, decided to stay in Lelystad for another winter and continue with the destruction. Since an engine overhaul is a labor-extensive process that involves sourcing a lot of parts and doing a lot of research, there was no chance for us to set sail before the winter. So we needed to change plans completely. We focused on smaller tasks and preparing everything for the next shipyard time. We wanted to figure out why the bathroom was always wet. So together with Herman, one of our patrons, we ripped out the interior and insulation of the bathroom in the aft cabin and found out that the water was coming from the bottom of the forward steel wall. And we closed off the second year of refitting Flying Coney by cutting a big leaking water tank into pieces. Probably not the most interesting jobs, but what needs to be done, needs to be done. In two years of refit, we repaired Flying Coney's wheelhouse, we emptied out the complete hull, which gives us a clean slate to build up from, and we de-rusted, repaired and recoated the entire hull. And now we have a good understanding what needs to be done to bring Flying Coney back to life. And we also know that there is still a lot of work ahead of us. So the first huge task for this year is to go back to the engine and to do an in-frame overhaul. We have a reliable engine again. Once that is done, we will start our next shipyard's time because we have to repair most of the frames in the former fish room and some in the forecastle. And of course we can't do that while Flying Coney is in the water. The last job we hope we get at least started on this year is the deck. Flying Coney still has a wooden deck underneath the steel deck. And unfortunately the deck is leaking. So we have to remove both layers, repair the steel deck beams and put a new steel deck on top of it. So quite a lot of work is waiting for us. I hope you enjoyed this recap. And if you want, you can head over to Patreon for real-time updates, weekly Zoom calls and Patreon-exclusive content. We offer a 7-day free trial to make it easy for you to check it out. By becoming a Patreon, you help us to make these videos and share this whole adventure with you. And that's something you really enjoy doing. 
So a big thank you to everyone who has donated or otherwise supported this project. And that's all we have time for today. Thank you so much for watching and see you next time. Wait, how long do you think it will take us to finish this project? Well, I think we need two more years.